Well, hello everybody. As it was raining, I wore wet, but it's nice to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with the joy of the Lord. And as we gather together in, in the name of Jesus Christ, may we just celebrate the victory we have in Jesus Christ. The passage of scripture I was thought of uh, looking into is found in Lamentations. Now, Lamentations is, uh, was uh, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was a prophet. And he saw all his people, a lot of his people, uh, taken captive and head to Babylon. He saw the, his uh, city destroyed. And yet, in and all, he has these words that found in uh, Lamentations 3, verses 21 to 26. A, mar a marvelous testimony of the Holy Spirit that was in him and that in each one of us. This I recall to mind. There is, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed, because his compassion fails not. They are renewed each morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait on him, to those who, to those soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait patient, quietly, for the salvation of the Lord is the Lord. Amen. Father in heaven, we just rejoice in the salvation of the Lord as we hear the songs that are sung by uh, those who play the musical instrument and lift up our voices together as one in union as we hear the message given by your servant Larry that the Holy Spirit has laid on his heart. May it lay on our hearts and just rejoice in the oneness together in Jesus Christ's name, we ask. Amen. Annual meeting tomorrow night. I'm going to drive the Malahat for dessert, and then I'll stay here for the meeting. I uh, appreciate Galen's call for prayer for the church. You know, the very first YouTube I watched of a service here, the first thing that I noticed was the thermostats right here, where it should be. Uh, and I thought, okay, probably early on, that was where the platform was. And uh, you, you moved it around to make it nice and close, and that's pretty good. But I, but I, but I did remember, when I saw that, I thought about uh, one of my, ch the church I pastored in Calgary, who... Uh, you know, when the sun came up in the morning and, uh, and came into the windows of that church, uh, it, it kind of got hot on this side, but this side was in the shadows and always a little cooler. And, and uh, invariably, uh, the folk on this side would think it's too hot. The ones on this side thought it was too cold. And so they would call respective ushers to come up and, and give them instructions on what needed to happen. And so my, I'd watch as my ushers would head back and, and uh, the thermostat was kind of in the foyer area. The, the problem was my ushers were deaf uh, and, and always forgetting their, their hearing aids. So, so I'm in the middle of this service and these guys are fighting in the back about how the heat's supposed to be up or down or back and forth. So, the church is a funny place, isn't it? A lot of ways we have those kind of stories of things and stuff that went on. But I love the church. To, to even say that, in Canada today, we're in a minority when we say that. Not many hold to that truth. But I find that church is the place where we do life together. So when some are anxious and hurting, think of the Johnsons today, you're, you're with them in this. When there's, when there's some achievement and accomplishment that takes place, we celebrate that together. We, we go in this life together. And that's a part of what church is. I, I love the church because it rescued the family that I grew up in. It, 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 I would say, has been the source of every good thing that has come to me. I'll maybe share more of that uh, along the way later on, but... But I, I love the church. I think you love the church too, because you're here. 
you, you had every, every uh, possibility and reason having had the, with others uh, during this season of COVID to, sort, to insulate yourself away, uh, to, to depend upon the technology of, of uh, YouTube and video and online stuff to be able to, to even watch a service and connect with family and people. But, but you came back and you're here. And I'm looking forward to getting to know some of you. So, so the, the message this morning I, I titled, We're in this together. Now, true confession, at first I titled it, We're in this mess together. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, that's a little negative way to start, especially since I don't know you. You, you might be the perfect group. You know, where your lives are operating on harmonious, peaceful life. You get away, you get along together always. Nobody ever disagrees. There's no discouraging words. Nobody gets grumpy <laughs> or anything like that. But on the chance, perhaps, that you're like every other church I know, <laughs> and that sometimes there are those bumps in the road along the way. The church gets a little messy sometimes. It's, it's important to, in those moments, remember and reflect and recognize that we are still in this together. Not in the sense that misery likes company, but in an understanding that you're not alone. You have others who know you and know you well. I love this quirky little poem uh, by Lisa Coons. It says, Church. A place where even the wild and woolly have grace. Where we don't have to have it all together once again. To come together once again. The humble sit forgiven and speechless. While the proud sit loudly and survey. The half dead or fully alive, at least for a while. The half crazed are calm once more. We in rare unity lift our hands and bow our heads. To worship God. Hmm. I'm looking forward to finding out who the wild and woolly are. and <laughs> the hat, You might have the odd half-crazed person here too. All of those other descriptions. But, but I like the fact that as well, we come together in unity. We lift our hands, we bow our head. And together we come to worship. I want you to consider the words that Paul um, has shared with another church that was in, in transition as well and in a time of discontinuous change is what we would refer to it as, and that's Romans chapter 12. I'm going to try to get the puff, puffiness to stop here. So. Romans 12, 1 to 8. And um, it, it, begins, it begins with the statement, therefore. Now, whenever you have therefore, you want to say, what's it therefore? Uh, it, it's, it's usually, a, that's a bridge word that says, now I'm going to take you from what I just taught you here and, and move you into the next phase of things. And, and the first 11 chapters of Roman are filled with r remarkable foundational truths about the Christian faith. In fact, I, on the slide, I, I, I put it in here that that um, a list of things. First of all, that all humans without exception are sinners in need of the righteousness that only God can provide. Second, that through Christ, God has provided a way for us to this righteousness by faith. That by his act, we are put into a right relationship with God again. That we're initially sanctified, set apart in Christ to share in God's glory and grace. That the way provided for all people everywhere, for Jews, Gentiles alike, for all mankind. And then he concludes with this most beautiful, uh, someplace in here, another one. Uh, the next slide. You can clearly tell I did the PowerPoint and haven't done it in a while. <laughs> so. But he has this great benediction at the, at the end that transitions. Oh, the depths and the riches of w the wisdom of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor who has ever given to God that God should repay them therefore. 
And he moves us into these. In light of all of these wonders and mercies and graces and acts of God on our behalf, we're, act, we're, we're called upon to live out a life as the Spirit leads us. There's some good news here. He reminds us we're in this together. And then verses 12, 1 to 8 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves in sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has uh, one body with many members, and those members don't have all the same functions, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the other. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to give, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Consider with me some of what Paul shares together here about this. There's, there's four movements that I see in these verses. The first is a radical surrender. Verse 1, therefore, uh, I call upon you in view of God's mercy to give your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, that's a call to be different. It's not that, it, that uh, surrender, uh, uh, doing all of that is hardly the language of our present society and order. How radically different from the individualism of our present day, when so many people's expectation is rooted and based in, in well, I deserve this. I have a right to this. I, I want this, and I want it now. I, I'm entitled. Surrender. Submission aren't warm and fuzzy words that our world uses at times. You're not going to find any books on the bookstore uh, on this. You're not going to find seminars being offered about, about how to submit. And yet here is a call for the believer that is on one hand very individual, but also supremely community. The strength here is on a living sacrifice. And, and the structure of the Greek is good because it, 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 it means not simply just a, a, a once in a t um, moment time, but it is, a, it, is a, it is a matter of a continual, full of life kind of, of uh, living. It's, it's a choice we make. It's, it's not something that is mechanical or automatic, but it's intentional. It's, it's the appeal of a loving relationship. It's the language of marriage. In, in marriage, we surrender to another person, don't we? Uh, I, I often, in uh, pre-marriage counseling with couples, would occasionally pause and say, you know, marriage is death. <laughs> and there'd be this, and there'd be the, why did we ask this guy to do <laughs> And then I'd explain, I'd, I'd, I'd say, uh, I'd say, you might have a lot of things figured out. W where you're going to live, and, and who's going to manage the finances, and whose career you're going to focus on for the future. But there are things you're going to discover about each other that, you, that never showed up in conversation and didn't, didn't arise in any kind of a preparation on that. You're going to discover uh, that, that at night, one of you wants the window open and one of you wants it closed. <laughs> that somebody likes it warm and another one wants it cool. And I can tell from the smiles of those of you who've been married, you all have your stories of <laughs> certain things that you realize, I didn't know, you know. And, and in that instance, one of you has to die to your desire for that in order to meet the need of the other person. Living a righteous life isn't the easiest life to live. There are times when you, you know, there are times when you just like to lie about something. Uh, or cheat or fudge the truth a little bit. There's, there are times when you just like to fly off the handle and 
and uh, and yell and scream and stomp your feet and there, there might be moments when when we have a bit of news that's really juicy to hear and you're just itching to tell somebody I mean it's not gossip if you text it right <laughs> I don't know I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but have any of you ever had a moment in time when on a Sunday morning you thought, you know, why don't I do like everybody else on my block and just sleep in and take it easy and, or, or go out and enjoy some of the beautiful sights you have here in Duncan? And yet, and yet you come here faithfully. You, you dutifully put your finances into that plate, the front or the one at the back. And you give a portion to the church. There, there are groups of you who take time out of your day to help out in the church. And some of you in other areas. I, I hear about the Blue Bus and Coastal Mission and the thrift store for Bibles. And, and, and you do it, I, I suggest, not out of guilt or not out of shame, but in view of the mercies of God. What He's done for you. And I've come to understand to, to live in this way, to be holy and pleasing to God, is beyond simple human ability. In and of myself, I'm not a good enough person to do it. Paul understood that, and so he draws us to the second movement here. The second movement is a remarkable remaking, where he says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve God's, what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I'm, I'm interested in the words that Paul uses here. The, the first injunction is negative. Don't be conformed. Now the word conformed uh, could be also interpreted disguised, masquerade, to put on a mask, to hide behind something. This, this is, uh, this is uh, under, you know, you might look a certain way, but underneath it's the same old you. It's, not an out, it's an outward change only, and underneath is that same old person. And, you know, when somebody decides that they're going to play church, they show up on a semi-annual basis, they put their $5 in the offering, they carry a Bible, they hum along with the choruses and the songs. Sociologists call those cultural Christians. They carry the name, but, and, and they know the practices, but it's all surface. I remember living like that. Some of you might as well. Where the disguise was Christian, but underneath it was dark and lost. Real, real transformation, what, what Romans talks about here is beyond the form of simply conforming, it is to transform. That Greek word that literally means metamorphosis, the, the image of the cocoon, that, uh, the, the, the caterpillar that goes in a cocoon and comes out totally different, uh, a butterfly. Everything remarkably different and changed. Just as that transformation takes place. William Greathouse, one of our general superintendents and a great scholar, wrote this in one of the commentaries on this. We, we, are, allow, we are to allow ourselves to be transformed, to, to continually remodeled. Continually remodeled, progressively sanctified. By this means our lives here and now may move and more clearly exhibit signs and tokens of the coming age of God. The transforming work of God in our life does, 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 looks like this. One, God, God gave us a new purity. There's a slide on this one as well, James. He gave us a new purity. He washed away our sins. Hallelujah. The ugliness of my past actions. He gave us a new identity. He called us sons and daughters. You are beloved of God. God gave us a new inclination that is an urge to do what is right. And, and uh, in our heritage, we call that initial sanctification. Setting ourselves aside to say we will live differently in this world. And God gave you a new power. Here's the truth. If you just conform, masquerade, put a mask on uh, to play church and being Christian, you're going to fail. You're going to slip up and the true nature is going to show up. We're just not good enough to do it without God's power at work in our life. My, my grandfather was a, was a veteran of two world wars. 
And, it, and in hindsight, it is likely that that some of those tough years of experience made him the man that most of us knew as we grew up. He was, he was mean. He was angry. He was a ticking time bomb who would every once in a while he'd explode in, a, in, a, in, in acts of rage and anger and violence. He'd swear, he'd throw things. He'd stomp out of the house. He'd be gone sometimes for days or even weeks. But at 82 eight, eight years of age, I think through my grandmother's faithful praying for him for 51 years. Eleanor, take hope for your brother. And the unfailing love of a church community. From all of that, he one day came to an altar of prayer, the pastor's wife beside him, sought for forgiveness. And I want you to know, he was a changed man. He was sweet and mellow and quick to tears when he talked about the change in his life. Transformed. The whole point of this was a moral renewal. Now note this, it isn't overnight. It's not a matter of somehow doing more, building up our lives a framework for living. It is, it is a matter of working at this. But the beauty of it is, Paul would say, is we are doing this together. The, the third movement in this passage is gaining a true vision and view of who I am. It, it's the call to be honest. Verse 3. For by the grace given, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself in sober judgment and in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. As, as, as God contemplates, as Paul contemplated, the outlining of God and how he works in us, he recognized that, that there's, there's two things that are ultimately going to derail us in this. That when we, when we recognize the gifts that God has given, we will either have an inflated idea of what we are like and what we can do and what we should do, or we will have too low an opinion of ourselves. Again, Greathouse says, our gift is not an occasion for selfish pride because we... This is a community asset, not a private hoard. We are to think of ourselves in sober judgment, being aware of the fact of the measure that God has given to us in accordance with the measure of his faith. There's no measure to the grace that God will give to us. But he's given to us various gifts that we can use for the strengthening of the church. They're different. They require more than simply just uh, uh, the work of the church requires more than simply what one person can accomplish and do together. But we hold to these simple fundamental facts. One, I am made in the image of God. I, I work with a number of uh, street missions and ministries. As a, it's a part of the Church of the Nazarene founded in formation. That's why we have the name we have is to not lose sight of the fact that we want to come alongside the marginalized. And and, uh, and, and on occasion have had an opportunity to sit down and shape vision and mission. And to me, the most beautiful, important truth is to be able to say, so that person coming through those doors who's got a, a scarred, marked, broken life that's a mess is made in the image of God, just as I am. And uh, it becomes the beginning point of hope. We're here for a purpose. I don't know about you, but that's so valuable. <laughs> You know, when I retired, that was one of those things I journaled and wrote about a lot is, so what do I do now when all my life before this has been kind of tied into the work and this routine and the job and the things that I did? And, and in the midst of it, to, to have God affirm and say, no, I still have a purpose for you. I'm unique. I'm different than you. You're different from me. Pause and see if there's an amen on that or how we get back. <laughs> so, aren't we glad of that, that we have this uniqueness about us? All of these things. God has a reason for making us the way that we are, me, you, and you. 
And we celebrate those differences as we work together. The, the fourth and final movement on this is a call to action. To do something on the basis of what God has provided for us together and individually. We're a body. We're in this together. So it's a call to action. So what do we need to do? I think there might be a slide on this one too, maybe. No, maybe not. We need to grow in our love of God. That's why the emphasis that we're in this together as a community of people surrendered in a faith and a life lived together in and with Christ. We need to enjoy and celebrate life. This is a great world and a good time and all of those things. And I, I only have to listen to you as you pray and as you as you speak about the, the concerns you have for others, that I hear the depth that you express for others in times of need. Em, uh, embrace the tangible presence of one with another. You know, Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling together with fellow believers. There's a reason for that. Never underestimate the power of presence with one with another. I mentioned last Sunday about when I was a kid and come home and I'd open the door and I'd just call out, you know, Mom, and if she was there, that's all I needed to know. Church is like that. Sometimes it, you just watch somebody come through the door and say, huh, good, I'm glad they're here. So embrace the transible, tangible presence, one with another. And then service, sharing together. I... I worked with a church in transition once and I did a series of conversations and interviews with a variety of individuals and asked them, what is it that they found most enriching? When, when is it that they found themselves feeling connected and engaged in the life of this church? And invariably, whether it was somebody who was 17 or somebody who was 87, invariably they would tell me about a story of time when they connected. Even for one guy who said, I remember that I belonged here when I got a call at night and, uh, and one, of the, one of the people from the church was saying, we had a flood in the basement, would you come and help us mop up? And he says, I went with a group of guys and mopped up that basement floor. I knew I belonged here. Not because of the work, but just because of the fellowship. The final thing on that, and oh, by the way, you do a lot of service here. I, I just think about care and taking the kids. What a blessing that is. I like kids. <laughs> but, but it's wonderful when somebody takes the time to focus in and build into their lives. I, I, I think about, I, I hear about things like the Blue Bus and all of those other things that, that you're involved in doing. I, I want to remind you to prayerfully consider strengthening your board. We have an annual meeting tomorrow if you're a member. It's been asked and announced uh, to make it a matter of prayer for yourself, or maybe you want to speak to somebody else and say, uh, I'd like to see if you would let your name stand for the board and let Wally know. The church is such an important part. I should mention too, you're in a fairly critical place in a, in a, in a position, in a direction. We, we don't have, a, we're, our system is not where you have a candidate come or a couple of candidates come and preach People wonder, why is that the case? Uh, my, my response generally has been, when you have somebody come and preach for you as a candidate, what you find out is, hopefully, they have at least one good message. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what you know. You don't know how they are going to respond to you when you end up in hospital like Bob has. You, you don't know how they're going to provide that pastoral care or support or the counsel they'll give, or all of the other elements that are there. And so we rely upon the board to do an interview and, a, and, a, and, a, and have that conversation with that person, and then prayerfully discern. They don't, they don't interview two or three people and then say, we'll take the best one. You see, it's not, they're not like uh, your, your grocery store down the way who's uh, saying, we'll, we'll interview all of these people and take the best one. In, in this instance, it's not uh, running the till at the front, it's caring for the church and the people. Your DS is very involved in this. And then they are involved. So that's the board's responsibility and duty. And, and they need your support and they need help. And if that's something you feel like prompted to be a part of, 
again, talk to Lily. In the midst of all of these things, and finally, there is prayer. It's a part of the service that we do. One with another. And again, I, I'm always moved when I hear people pray for, for, the, for their fellow believers. We pray for uh, one another in times of change and transition, and most certainly of all, in this time. Let me pray for you in just this moment, and then we'll have the music people come and, and share in the second package of that. Father, I come before you. I thank you for church. We're in this together. I'm grateful for every countless story of God's mercy and grace that's a part of the story of these, your people. We're reminded, as was shared in the very opening here, Bob, Jeremiah, in the depths of a certain discouragement, saying, my soul is withered up, but then I call to mind. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails new every morning. I thank you for faithful people, dedicated people. I thank you for the church. That this place indeed would continue to be a beacon of hope and life, light for her people and for the people nearby. I fully expect, Father, last night, in walking distance from this church, there's a family in crisis, arguing and fighting and lots of dark, difficult things. I expect within walking distance of their church, there's somebody wrestling with, does anybody even care? Loneliness, etching into their heart life. Surely, Father, somebody drives by this church every day and they're feeling despondent and uncertain about purpose, meaning you have an answer. We're grateful for that. Hopeful, Father, that we would be in touch with them or that they would walk through these doors one day and find not simply a good fellowship of people, but the hope that is Christ in us. And for this, I give you thanks and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand for the benediction. Father, as believers, you reveal your heart in us to others. So my prayer for these, your people, O oh Father, is that we might shine as the light of God's goodness in a dark and difficult world. That you reveal the heart of God through the way we speak, treat, and honor others that you will represent through us the humility of Jesus by serving and not being self-seeking, that you'll reveal God's grace in the offering of compassion when others treat us poorly. And will you display courage that comes from a true understanding of God's unconditional love by living authentically in this world. And I pray, Father, that we would share the heart of in all we do. Bless these your people, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.